Good evening and welcome here tonight to the third in our series of events called the Earth Convention, which 5 by 15 are doing in conjunction with Rathbones. And we're really pleased this week that we are also part of Climate Action Week, which has been going on well all this week with a series of talks and webinars and events that you can sign up to online. We've had a really great time presenting this series and about climate change and what we can all do about it. So far, we've had debates on finance, on energy transition, and of course, the fallout from the COVID pandemic, which I'm sure is going to rear its head again tonight. Can 2020 be a moment when we really do reset the debate and move forward towards solving the problems that we face? Our very first speaker in our very, very first event, the quite formidable Christiana Figueres, set out in no uncertain terms that this next decade, and we've only got a few more weeks of the first year, is absolutely crucial in the process of trying to get climate change under control. We have to reach 50% reduction by 2030, or it's just going to be simply too much for us to catch up with. We don't have time to waste, as she said, we can't kick this can down the road anymore. We can't say it's a problem for future generations. So today we're going to turn our attention, as you know from the title about fast fashion, consumers and plastics and manufacturing to us and to what we do and the lifestyles we lead and how much they power the problems. The world consumes a staggering 80 billion items of clothing a year. That's just one statistic. You only have to look at the books of someone like Lucy Siegel or indeed Dieter Hell to get statistics that make your head reel. From palm oil to plastics and petrochemicals, our consumption patterns and the supply chains that go behind them have this huge impact. And like everything, these are things that have to change. It might not be the message everybody wants to hear, but it is the reality, as I think we'll hear from our speakers. So I'm incredibly pleased to be welcoming four fantastic thinkers and writers, Steve Evans, Lucy Siegel, Dieter Helm, and Miata Farn Buller, to discuss this issue of consumers with a special emphasis around things like fashion, disposables, plastics. Um, Rathbones, our wonderful partners, have produced a third set of their Planet Papers, setting out their thoughts on these subjects. And we'll share those after the event. And they've also got two podcasts. The details of all of these things will be in the chat box, as well as details of our speakers' books. Now, format is really simple. The speakers are going to speak for about six, five, six minutes each. Then we'll have some questions. Then we're going to come over to you for your questions and please put them in the Q&A box. We always get lots and we'll try to get to as many as we can, but forgive us if we can't do them all. So with further no, no further ado, I'm really thrilled to welcome our first speaker tonight, who is Professor Dieter Helm from Oxford University. Dieter's um, incredibly influential book, Natural Capital, really has changed the way that this government sees the environment and farming. Indeed, in the agriculture bill that's just going through, we have new systems of payments that take into account things like soil, water quality, air quality, and knowing that these are things that do not at the moment have any market value, Dieter's work has formed the basis of a new agricultural agreement whereby these things will be rewarded. It's massively influential and I couldn't be happier to have him here. Now his new book, which I happen to have right here, is net zero. And it tells us what we have to do. Um, it's not easy, as I think Dieter will tell us, but uh, over to you, Dieter, and thanks so much for being here. And please, please buy the book. The details will be on the chat box. Well, thank you very much, Rosie. And thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me along. Um, in my five minutes, I want to get over the centrality of consumption and what we individually do as part of the uh, reset to address climate change. So my first point I want to make is I think a startling one. It is that in the last 30 years of trying to address climate change, we have not made a dent in the annual increase in carbon concentration in the atmosphere. And that's the only number that matters really it's the consequence of how much carbon the natural world takes out of the atmosphere and how much we put into it. 
So since 1990, every single year, without a single blip, including this year of the coronavirus, we have added two parts per million to the atmosphere. It's basically a straight line. And if you go back to 1990 and say, you know, would it be, really be the case that we'd be at 417 parts per million so far? It would have surprised people. And what this tells you is that one more heave of what we've been doing isn't going to crack the problem. And there's a fundamental issue at stake here. Lots of people are running around thinking, you know, net zero, that'll do it. Big announcements from the prime minister, 10 point plans. You know, we're all on the way, COP26. Really? Okay. So the Climate Change Committee said last summer, when we get to zero, we will no longer be causing climate change. Not true. A, we're never going to get to zero, nor should we ever get to zero, because our world is made of carbon. But um, we will carry on doing what we've been doing for the last 30 years, which is gradually deindustrializing, concentrating on territorial carbon production here in the UK, trying to get that down and basically importing the stuff instead. So all that stuff produced in China, right, isn't just their responsibility, their problem, it's for us and for Americans and for Europeans from the developed world. And so if we want to have a unilateral carbon policy and we want to ensure that we are no longer causing climate change, and I'm sure all of us probably want to do that, then we have to be honest. We have to say, it doesn't matter where the carbon's produced. It doesn't matter where the emissions take place. And so we have to address the consequences of the carbon embedded in our imports, as well as what we produce here. Whether it be beans imported by air from Kenya, asparagus from uh, Peru, or steel from China. And once you realize that what we have to do is get to net zero carbon consumption, you realize it's us that are ultimately the polluters. We can blame nasty corporations, you know, the ghastly people who are polluting the planet. They're polluting the planet for us. They're making the plastic for us. They're making the fashion for us. They're making the steel for us. It's for us in the end, the economy exists. And the way to see what one's carbon footprint is, is to do something I recommend in my book, which is to construct your own carbon diary. Try for a day to write down from when you get up in the morning to when you go to bed, all the things you do and have a hazard of how much carbon's in there. You know, from flushing the loo first thing in the morning and think about the energy needed to do that and the paper you might use through to the palm oil that goes into your breakfast, the cardboard for the cereal box, right through to the clothes, the fashion, the travel that you do. And then you'll realize that if you want to live in a world in 250, which is genuinely net zero, all that carbon's got to go. It's not your fault, but that's what we actually have to do. And then you realize that decarbonization is not some technical problem that economists and others sort of solve and prime ministers make great speeches about. It's about us. It's about the change that we will have to make to achieve that outcome. And all we're really doing is recognizing that we're all living beyond our environmental means. Now, that might seem a negative thing to say, but actually it's an incredibly positive and empowering thing. Because once you realize it's you and me, you can start doing things about it. I stopped flying last year before the coronavirus came along. I, I'm as hypocritical as I expect most people are in the climate world. I do all sorts of terrible things, but that was the first step I made. You can do that. That's a step forward. There are lots of other things that follow. And it's not true that you have to be hair shirt. It's not all uh, sacks and ash cloth. It is the case that we can have sustainable economic growth, but it's first of all, a recognition that we have to get onto that sustainable path. And I'm afraid what that means is that polluters have to pay. An efficient economy incorporates all the pollution into the prices in the economy. And that means a carbon price and a carbon tax. You and I should pay for the carbon embedded in that asparagus from Peru, the beef imported from the Amazon, and for that steel that comes on board. And once we have to pay that price of carbon, we start to seek out low carbon alternatives, and we start to conduct our economic life in a way that's compatible with the planet. Now, you might think, well, that's a big ask. 
politically maybe not doable. But either we do it or we stop pretending that we're no longer going to contribute to climate change. That's the choice. And if we genuinely unilaterally want to do this, that's what has to follow. So it's perfectly possible to do this. It is a radical change in what we do. It does require a price of carbon and it does require addressing imports. But if we do that stuff, if we accept our responsibility, if we focus on carbon, then that's the path where we can get off the 30 wasted years we've had in which we've made not a single dent in the growth of emissions. We can't go on like that. We will fry if we do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dieter. That's a very um, emphatic start. Um, it doesn't leave us a lot of wriggle room, but uh, I think we all sort of know that, but don't really want to accept it quite yet. I'm just thinking about all the things in this room that have come from different places, and I can't imagine what the carbon footprint just around me would be. Um, our next speaker tonight is Lucy Siegel, who is uh, no stranger to anyone who watches The One Show or indeed reads The Guardian or The Observer. She has been an absolute pioneer of looking first of all at fashion and the disposability and the incredible and awful planetary consequences of it. And her newest book is in fact, Turning the Tide on Plastic, which I am reading at the moment. And it is full of statistics that are so overwhelming that you you kind of gasp. I mean, it's true that probably there's nothing inherently wrong with plastic. I have got a plastic mug right here, but I've had this plastic mug for maybe 10 or 15 years and it's, um, it's really good. It's about the throwaway culture. So Lucy is also the co-founder of the Green Carpet Challenge with Livia Firth. And she, as I say, she co-hosts a wonderful podcast called um, so hot right now, which I thoroughly recommend. So Lucy, over to you and thank you very much for being here. Oh, thank you, Rosie, for that very generous introduction. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, yeah, so uh, Rosie just told you a little bit about the book that I wrote, Turning the Tide on Plastic. And that really, as Rosie says, is about single use disposable plastic. And I was really um, sort of amused yesterday when I got my, um, my scripts or my notes for filming that there was a piece to camera where we look at the camera as I'm doing now talking to you. And I was supposed to describe myself as an anti-plastic person or anti-plastic campaigner. I don't feel I'm anti any material, any inert material, because I think that would be slightly bonkers. But I do take a view on which materials are best placed to do the job uh, at the time. And that for me is because nature is, is the, you know, I'm not the first person to say this or the only person, but nature is the context. And really we have to think within the boundaries set by the planet because as um, Dieter made really clear, there is a, you know, there's a crisis here. We're not, this is not hyperbole. This is something that we need to respond to immediately. And I've read a lot of stuff that suggests that as citizens of privileged citizens of developed countries, we need to cut our carbon footprint by 80% and that the products and services that we consume on a daily basis, those are the things that are driving our, contrib our contribution to the uh, climate crisis. Um, so it's obviously incredibly serious. We are trapped in what I would call a bonkers model of consumerism. We're trapped in a linear economy of take, make and waste. So we take, extract a lot of uh, resources, we make something, and then we waste or we discard far, far too early. So unlike Rosie's vintage plastic beaker, most products we are, you know, we're not consuming at that rate, at a sustainable rate. So when it comes to fashion, and as Rosie mentions, I've done a lot of work around the fashion industry, partly, and, and really the motivation for that initially was because my own fashion footprint was so horrendous. I was a big consumer of fast fashion when I started this work um, and our, um, uh, this, this, the amount of time we keep things in our wardrobe for has declined until um, a couple of years ago when I did some extra research on what I would call 
then a mid price point. So not a, a very, very cheap item, but a dress that was uh, in somebody's wardrobe or sorry, it was, it was a price point around hundred pounds from one of the online retailers. Um, they were designing that and they were told to design that with this idea in mind, that that would be in the consumer's wardrobe for a maximum of five weeks. Now, since then, that period has declined and that's not a cheap item. Um, so I think in the UK, we have big plastic footprints because we're a supermarket economy and we um, get through a lot of packaging. Um, but we're also an engine of fast fashion consumption and we have some of the most famous fast fashion brands in the world. In fact, we're pretty, probably the sort of architects of fast fashion in the UK. And I feel that we are sitting ducks really for, for, for this particular form of linear uh, consumption and the linear economy and that we have the holy triumvirate of fast fashion, fast tech and fast food that is particularly sold to uh, younger citizens who are just constantly classified as consumers um, and hunted really when you look at the formats that platforms like Instagram use to bombard younger, younger consumers with products uh, from morn till night. Uh, and really they're used as a sweetener for what I would argue is um, a spiral to a low wage economy. So this is all you can afford becomes the mantra. I wanted to talk a little bit in my uh, five minutes, which are rapidly, um, my time will be up very soon. I want to talk a little bit about my work. And so I've often found myself classified as a consumer journalist. So because I covered the environment or nature and climate, from a lifestyle perspective. So my first column was in the Observer magazine for many, many years. And um, I was then used sort of sometimes um, interchangeably on what, we, what you might call normal consumer stories. So I think um, environmental consumerism or ethical consumerism has been thought of as being uh, interchangeable with linear consumerism. Now in fashion, that's created a real problem. So one of the questions that I have been constantly asked throughout my career is, oh, it's terrible. I produced um, a movie called The True Cost, which was on Netflix um, and it launched in 2015. And it shows the supply chain issues of fast fashion before the terrible Rana Plaza disaster when over a thousand people lost their lives making fashion for Western brands uh, in that terrible factory collapse. And afterwards, lots of people would come to me and say, this is terrible. I don't want to buy into this. So where can I get this product at that exact price point, uh, but it's, it's just ethical? And I would have to explain every time that it's not just an analog, it's a different system. Fast fashion is a system which I contend uh, produces for overproduction, for overconsumption. It creates enormous amount of waste. It creates enormous about amounts of pollution. And the, um, the responsibility is shouldered by those who can least afford it in the supply chain. So these are the systems that are uh, propped up by our rapacious desire to consume low, uh, uh, sorry, cheap products. And I think we also have to think, I can get quite emotional about this topic. And for me, it is really emotional because I think we also have to think about what is lost and the trade-offs are not very clear to us and they're not presented to us in a very transparent fashion. And I always come back to the um, environmental poet, I don't know if that's the right term for him, but Wendell Berry, and he warns that the global economy ignores natural and human capital, and it serves to institutionalize a global ignorance in which producers and consumers cannot know, cannot care about one another, and in which the histories of all products will be lost. In such a circumstance, the degradation of products and places, producers and consumers is inevitable. So for me, fighting about against that inevitability has been the thing that has well driven my work, really. And one of the uh, beacons of hope that I see and one of the systems that I think is really, really important is a real circular economy. I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit about that tonight. But this is where the value of the materials uh, is kept 
within within uh, uh, a system where we don't make for landfill and we don't design for landfill or incineration. And this comes back to if people train as a designer and I've worked with so many fashion designers over the years and I've been privileged to work with a lot of them. I can tell you that not one went into design to design for landfill or incineration. So just to sum up, I think that as consumers, we're often called brattish and demanding and all the rest of it. There was a great headline this week where a model called Nina Bailey uh, protested in all the tabloids that her 18 pound jumpsuit from a brand called Misguided had ruined her 60 grand Porsche. We can, we can deconstruct that uh, during the conversation, but that for me summed up a lot of what today's consumerism is about. I don't think we're demanding enough as consumers. I think we're global citizens first, but I think we should be more demanding about the things that matter, which are nature and climate. Thank you so much, Lucy. I've never really thought about the fashion world as a system like that. I think about the food system and how it's inevitable that you end up eating junk food. Um, and the to apply that same idea to fashion is really interesting. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, our next speaker is the economist, Miata Fan Buller. She's also the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, which is a brilliant think tank that for many years now has been looking at the impacts of things that happen in the high street, how what happens locally really affects it. I, I always remember with Neff, you know, they were the first people who really understood that if you spent your money locally, it helped boost the local economy. Whereas if you went and spent it in your supermarket, which was a global brand, then the money was sucked away from the system. It's very, very powerful messages. And Miata, I, I know you've been thinking a lot too about um, what we're going to do on our high streets as retail collapses, what's the effect of everybody buying things online all the time. Um, so please over to you and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Absolutely delighted uh, to be here and delighted to be part of this conversation. And you know, in the end, the big exam question that we're all asking ourselves is what can we do? What can we do as uh, individuals? What can we do as consumers? And I don't think we can have that conversation without sort of taking a step back um, and locating it in the quite profound moment that we're in. Uh, you know, we are in a pandemic um, that is being accompanied by an unprecedented economic crisis. Uh, the early warning signs are clear, 12% hit to the economy this year, uh, the sharpest contraction for 300 years. We may be looking at about 3.5 million unemployed by next year. Uh, so we should be in no doubt uh, that we are in an absolute profound moment. But I think it's an economic crisis that's shining a huge spotlight um, on some deep seated structural problems with our economy and our economic model. And I think uh, Lucy, Disa have sort of um, spoken to this. Um, you know, I think it's shining a spotlight on how, how, how living standards have barely shifted in a decade, uh, how denuded some of our social protections have become. And I think for the purposes of this conversation, it's shining a massive spotlight on the cost and on the untold suffering of not responding to these sorts of natural crises, despite, despite the warnings of the scientists. And the parallels for the climate and the nature crisis are absolutely clear. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, the thing that has really struck me is that for those of us that have been advocating for radical action, because I think it does require radical action in response to the nature and the climate crisis, we've long said, look, this is a crisis that is unprecedented in scale and that it will change everything. But I think if we're very honest with ourselves, this has always been quite hard for people to conceive, for people to conceptualize, to imagine, so that it can impact on day-to-day -day behavior, day-to-day -day consumption. But we are now in a crisis that is unprecedented, that is requiring us to do things that few of us could have imagined but a year ago, and that is changing everything and causing untold hardship. And this is just a taster of what it will feel like when we are in the eye of the storm of the climate crisis. And I think the thing that's really struck me is how quickly that has crystallized in the public mood and the public consciousness. 
The polling suggests that there is strong appetite not to revert back to the old normal and that we need to build back something better coming out of this. There's a strong sense that the recovery must be green. So 67, 67% of people that were polled believe that a failure to make our recovery green would be bad for the economy in the long term. 69% believe that it would be a sign that the government had the wrong priorities. Now, this is a huge step forward. And I think this sentiment is being reflected by our politicians. So, you know, it is a sign of the times that today the prime minister came out with a 10 point plan for climate. We can argue about whether it went far enough, but it was the key centerpiece of a reset of his government. I think it speaks to where the politics is on this. Now, the million dollar question, and I think the thing that we're grappling with today, is will this sentiment translate organically into the sort of change that we need to happen? And I think you know, many people point to the fact that lockdowns and restrictions imposed by the pandemic has already started to shift individual behaviors and consumer patterns, um, and is accelerating the transition that we desperately, desperately need to happen. And yeah, I agree with that. There are positive signs. We know from international surveys that consumers are more mindful than they have ever been before about what they're buying. So 62% of consumers agree uh, that they will increase their focus on climate change and how their actions impact on the planet, which again is a massive step forward. Demand for local goods is growing as consumers seek products that they know that they trust and that are available locally. And I think the hit of the pandemic, quite frankly, on certain sectors that in truth had to transition and probably had to contract, like aviation, like fossil fuels, are going to mean that they are substantially smaller on the other side of this, also accelerating the transition that needs to happen. Um, and you know, consumer choices, like the fact that we've been told that we can't fly as much, uh, or we're having to staycation more, we're driving less, we're working from home, a lot of that will stick but will it be enough? My view is that absolutely it will help um, and it will start moving us in the direction that we need to get to, but not nearly at the scale or the pace that we need. Individual action, shifts in consumer pattern are important and they provide important signals for markets that must shift, that must respond to the climate imperative. But if we are going to shift the dial in the way that we need to, at the pace that we need to, I think it's clear that we need large scale intervention. It has to be a collective endeavor. Um, and which is why organizations like our own have been calling for something that we call a Green New Deal. The idea is a very simple one. It's an unprecedented mobilization of resources of the sorts that we have never achieved in peacetime, but actually are having to achieve in the context of a pandemic to decarbonize the economy at pace, creating, we hope, hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country, millions of jobs across the, um, the world, and lifting living standards at the same time. But at the heart of this, and this is the key point, there is a recognition that you know, the threat to our environment is a system of symptom of an economic system that is failing. And it's the same economic system, by the way, that's failing millions of people as living standards have stagnated over the last decade. So if we want to tackle climate change, we've also got to seek to transform our economy. And we need to do that in a way that works for the majority of people. And I think this moment of rupture, because it is a huge moment of rupture that we're in, creates the space for us to do this. This moment of rupture creates the space for us to think big, to think ambitiously, to think radically. But to be transformative, I think a Green New Deal needs to do three things. First, it's got to be ambitious. Radical reductions in carbon emissions in the next decade, the heavy lifting has to be done in the next 10 years, um, which would then send signals at every level of society that would begin to shift productions that would begin to shift transport modes and patterns, that would begin to shift consumer patterns. I think the second thing is that a just transition, which is the thing that we have got to achieve, because in the end, there will be lives and people's uh, living standards that will be impacted by any sort of transition, has got to be matched by a significant investment in resources. 
So, you know, governments, in my view, should be committing about 2% of GDP, ramping up to 5% of GDP to tackle this. Uh, and we should be starting with a big fiscal stimulus to pave the pathway out of this recovery. You know, governments are going to have to spend money in order to get us out of the current uh, economic crisis. And so it's a no brainer that they make this uh, green. Today, the government talked about a 12 billion investment in green infrastructure and technology. You know, we should be talking about 30 billion investment in the next two years to unlock 400,000 jobs. Um, but this has to go alongside incentives and regulations to start shifting markets uh, that have been slow to respond. Legislation and regulation matters. Individual behavior matters, but legislation and regulation matters. Banning petrol and diesel cars in the next 10 years will shift production far faster than that would have happened organically, and it will shift consumer patterns. And then the final thing I'd say is that for this to work, for us to transition, and this will change every aspect of our lives, there has to be a good deal for the public in return for consenting for this. And, you know, so for me, through this investment program, we've got to try to create better jobs to replace the ones that will be lost. But the green economy that emerges must be owned by all of us and might, must work in our interests. So collective ownership of green infrastructure and assets we invest in, from renewable energy to public transport to fleets of electric cars, but more cooperative ways of organizing the new industries that will spring up. Cooperative insulation, insulation companies, energy production, where we as consumers, where we as people in communities, whereas we as employees have a stake in the businesses that will fire up the future. And if we get this right, we can transform our economy. So it works for the planet, but it also works for people as well. It is absolutely within our grasp, but it won't happen unless the movement that is growing day by day continues to apply pressure for radical change. And this is the final thing I'll say. This is where there is a powerful role for each of us to play as individuals, as consumers, to lend our voices to the growing numbers calling for radical action in response to climate change, bridging divides from left of the spectrum to right of the spectrum, from old to young, reaching out to our families, to our friends, to our communities, yes, convincing people that we must not go back. Okay, I'm going to come in now because we are, you're slightly overrunning your time. Is that okay? That was absolutely wonderful. And I will pick up a load of that in the questions. Um, I just want to get, get to Steve because we do have, and there's lots and lots and lots of questions coming in from our audience. So thank you. And I'd like now to introduce our, our final speaker who is called Steve Evans. And he is the Director of Research in Industrial Sustainability at Cambridge, which sounds like quite a mouthful but in fact Steve's right on the cutting edge of all sorts of new developments. He works with manufacturers, he looks at products that might really be game changers and figures out how to scale them. I've watched videos of him talking about the need for speed. Um, I think he also has quite a few quite controversial views on the subjects that we've been talking about and I think he'll probably give us an awful lot to talk about when he's finished. So Steve thank you so much, welcome to the event. Thank you. It's great to be here. And it's actually really great to hear the urgency. And we're all talking about 2030, which is fantastic. But we're going to be in trouble if we don't move the needle before 2022. Right. Let's be honest about it. If we do all of this in 2028, 29, we're in trouble. Um, I try to answer a research question. What can we do without changing science and policy? Uh, for two reasons. It seems to me both of those mechanisms take too long. And Secondly, I'm not smart enough to be a scientist or a policymaker, right? My research looks at three things. The sort of system transformation that Lucy was talking about, we study. How does a sector like fashion change as a system? We also do a lot of work on something terribly boring called efficiency. Um, I've been working on a denim jeans factory in Ho Chi Minh City. When we started, they used 800 liters of water to make one pair of jeans. That's pretty normal. At the time, the world record was 435. 
by the time we stopped, it was one liter. We need to learn the industrial system is part of the problem and it's not just consumption. But the piece of research I want to talk about today, we do a lot of work on what can the retailers do? So not what can the consumers do? What can the retailers change to make consumption more sustainable? And I want to use fast fashion as a project example. A few years ago, we were asked to apply our systems thinking tools to the problem of fast fashion. I spent a lot of time with ethnographers and what are called fast fashionistas. On average, they spend between 50 and 75 pounds per week on clothes. They buy something that's called a marquee item, which has a modal use of one. It's used once and never used again. They buy a few other accessories. On average, they have three and a half thousand pounds credit card debt. We need to better understand their world if we want to influence their world, and we spent a lot of time there. But then we came up together with a particular company with a really great idea that I want to share with you. What if those same people, instead of spending over 200 pounds a month on clothes, spent 100 pounds to own a store card that allowed them to have 20 items at home? So their, all, their home wardrobe has become lean. But those 20 items, you can take any number of them any day of the week, go back to the store and swap them for anything that's hanging up in the store. So they have two wardrobes, one of 20 items and one of 2,000 items. If you then run the numbers about what happens in that system, and we did incredibly detailed analysis, we calculated how many buttons would fall off on the 10th use and what that would cost and that level of detail, you end up with a system that I'm going to suggest allows that customer to continue to have fun. If they desperately want to change clothes three times a week, they can go and do it. They want to go out on Saturday with their friends and have an enormously important social experience. We can halve the cost. So we're going from over 200 pounds a month to 100 pounds a month. At the same time, we double the profit of the retailer. And at the same time, we halve the amount of fiber needed to deliver that system. Now, some of us call this a circular system, right? So it's got a fancy name now. Circular economy is very fashionable, but it can work. And I'm trying to be very practical. If you halve the fiber, you halve the water, the environmental impact, the CO2 of the entire system. You halve climate change, double profit, half the price to the consumer, and you continue to have fun. I think it's part of the puzzle. It's not going to get us all the way to where we want to be. To get all the way to where we want to be, which is zero carbon delivered by 2050 and potentially restorative, so negative carbon, we have to do much more than just this type of change. But let's not allow the retailers off the hook. They're part of the program of change that they should be part of this conversation that we're having today. Now, we also do research on why is it that organizations are not doing this very quickly? And I just want to offer up one of many insights about why it's difficult to actually do this. Imagine I make a pitch to the CEO of this retailer and I'm saying, I can double your profit and halve your income from your customer. I am suggesting that they halve the size of the company that they're chief executive of. And I, even if it's double the dividend and double the profit, who in a macho world of business wants to be CEO of a smaller company? And these are the sorts of issues, and there are many others that are very practical that we have to overcome if we want the retailers to be a lot better. And I'm going to stop there. Steve, thank you very much. That's a completely fascinating idea about this sort of lending library of clothes. And uh, can I, Lucy, can I ask you, um, can we unmute everybody? Um, Lucy, what, what do you think about that? What would be, would it satisfy people? Would it satisfy that itch? Yeah, definitely, because I think from, I mean, Steve, Steve might know more than me, but I don't think we've got a huge amount of evidence about neurologically what happens when we when we consume fast fashion, but we do have some. There is There are a couple of experiments, and I think what it shows, if I'm right, um, is that it's the hunting down, um, the, the getting of the, the garment, and by the time you've got to the till or checked out online, you're pretty much over it. 
So there's a specific point. I mean, Steve mentioned, you know, the, the sort of buzz that you get from something new. And some people do seem to need that more than others, the dopamine hit or whatever it is. And so if you can get that into another format, that's absolutely brilliant. I'm really, really interested in rental systems. And that's like a sort of really smart form of it. And also I would do anything to take away the stigma. I hate the idea that we have to... Um, the, the, the suggested remedy for fast fashion is people who can't afford it having to agonize about, you know, being a fast fashion consumer. So anything we can do to get around that is amazing. And we haven't tried hard enough as a sustainable fashion community to address that problem. We've just gone, oh, shop in a charity shop. Mm -hmm. which is really not what a lot of people want to do. So I think it's like a really tantalizing solution. I'd like to hear more about it. Um, Dieter, one of the things, of course, you said with having carbon pricing is that, I mean, is everything inevitably much more expensive? Is that the end, the end result of that plan? I can see Steve shaking his head, so I'll come to him next. But when you say that we must put a carbon price on, does it mean we pay more? Well, if you have an overwhelmingly carbon intensive economy, and that's us consuming carbon, and if you want to go from that economy to an economy that's incredibly low carbon, um, it follows that you're currently not paying the cost of the pollution you're causing through the carbon. And that follows from that, that your consumption level and aggregate consumption economy is unsustainably high. Now, what you hope to happen with the carbon price is it incentivizes people to switch and choose those things which are going to be relatively lowering costs now because they're not carbon priced and it helps people to make the choices they need to make to switch from one thing to another. Put it in the most simple way. Take agriculture. You know, if you paid the carbon content of a, of a piece of beef produced in Brazil and you compared it with a piece of beef produced on Exmoor, the relative prices are going to change a lot. Indeed, it's still open trade, but it's fair trade. It's every, every bit of trade incorporates the proper carbon price. And so therefore, it's going to be a bonus to those things produced here because they're going to have a bigger demand. And yes, if you really want to eat beef from um, uh, uh, Brazil or you really want to have uh, green beans nicely wrapped, imported from Kenya at Christmas, you're going to pay a bit more. But does that make us, you know, actually worse off? No. Mm. And of course, remember, this, op uh, this is in a framework in which economic growth goes on because technical change goes on. So it's not as if we have to stop the economy. It's just we have to rebase it to one that's on a trajectory to going to z net zero carbon consumption through time. And Steve, that's a lot of what you do, isn't it? Looking for things that have a much lower carbon footprint that, that can then be scaled. I mean, I'm just thinking of your clothing lending library. Presumably all those clothes would be very good quality, precisely because if they're rotten quality, the buttons will fall off. So the retailers really understand fibre technology. They understand what finishes to put on and exactly what wash and what chemistry to use when you're washing, so that after 20 washes, the average consumer cannot tell the difference with a new item that's hanging in the shop. And what we're doing is we're rewarding their technological know-how. Mm -hmm. When they sell it to us, they're not putting those same finishes on because we are not going to use the best chemistry to wash it. And this is exactly the sort of system change that Lucy's referring to. And in fact, that Dieter's referring to in if you price carbon properly, you end up creating a different system. The total cost of ownership then goes down and either matches or falls below the existing system. So we can afford great goods. That's very nice to know. Um, Miata, um, can I come back to what I, I sort of said in the introduction to you? Because I know I always think of NEF as being so good of understanding the way that local economies work. I mean, we all know that the high street's been dying and we all know post COVID things are certainly local high street in Taunton and Somerset where um, I'm quite near at the moment. I mean, the high street is looking so depressed. How do we reinvigorate that? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and, and what's happened is the a trend that was already there. So many of our high streets were struggling before COVID has been hugely, hugely accelerated. Um, in part driven by the fact that retail, um, online retail um, has been sort of driving so much demand. The, the positive bit is that actually where people have the opportunity, they have been quite minded to go to their local high streets, to go to their local shops for certain things. And I think that's something that we can build on. For me, the answer to this is we've got to reimagine what the high street looks like. We have to try to create it as kind of core community hubs. And there's some really interesting thinking happening in lots of kind of local areas where they're saying, actually, could we, for example, as the council or could we um, as community groups buy up part of our high street? use some of the facilities for things that you know community hubs where they're partly workspaces they're partly crashes we use them flexibly um, and trying to create spaces that aren't just about retail but blend retail with housing with community facilities that people want to go to and then what that will do is incentivize people not to want to go you know 10 miles to get something but to try to look closer to home and there are benefits for the kind of environment uh, for that as well but it's a huge huge lift um, but the alternative is that we have hollow high streets and we have people traveling further to get the things that they need thank you thank you um i'm going to bring in uh some of the questions because we've got lots but just before we do um lucy we haven't actually discussed the whole world of plastic which is obviously hugely important i mean even if you just get a garment which is sent to you through online it's covered in plastic what where do you see you know because obviously this is so bound up with a consumer society and especially it's bound up with food which is my obsession well you know what it it changes really quickly so yesterday, I'm not sure this is relevant, I'll just go with it. Yesterday I was in Deeside um, in the Northwest in a, a recycling center. And I went there because I'd received lots of complaints from viewers of the show that I work on that eggs were now being sold in plastic egg boxes. And they love a cardboard egg box. Most people love a cardboard egg box. It's sustainable, it's made of recycled, 90% recycled content. It does the job well. You're trained subconsciously to lift the lid and see if your eggs are okay. And they suddenly were like noticing a difference and they were, you know, freaking out. And they were like, is this a COVID covert, get pl more plastic into this country? So I went and had a, a bit of an investigation. And what's happened is because we've all been going online, that we've all been getting cardboard sent to, ha to, to home. And the usual way that you get cardboard is from newsprint. You, you, might, you might know this, Rosie, from the you know, newspaper background. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it goes all yesterday, all the magazines of the Sunday magazines were it being off to be pulped were in this place, and a lot of them go into egg boxes. But it's a shift because that's clean waste from factories and news agents and retailers. It hasn't gone to our houses. And this whole industry, this whole packaging industry, they really only like that clean waste. They don't really like all the stuff from our bins. It's just, you know, it's disgusting. It needs sorting. It's low grade waste. Most of it gets exported. So they've just had to do this like COVID shift because everyone's receiving all these Amazon parcels and all the cardboard was coming to our houses. So DEFRA had to get involved, local authorities had to get their recycling teams out. So, but the system shifts so quickly and is really, really responsive. And it just sort of taught me how packaging can shift if there's enough impetus for it to do so. And I think because the, the consumer demand, they call it the Attenborough effect, don't they, from our planet. I think that has had a continued effect and people are noticing. And I think actually that's quite important. It hasn't really put a massive dent in, in the volume of plastic, unfortunately. In fact, that's going up and up and up. And I've just seen a report that says um, the amount going into the oceans only dropped by 7%, even if you add in all of the energy and all of the different schemes to stop plastic going in the ocean. But what I think it has done is send a message to retailers. And if you need to switch to plastic, you better be switching back really really quickly so I don't think that answers the question but there's some sort of there's something happening there which is kind of interesting I don't know what it is yet um right some questions from the audience a question here from Hugo to Dita um 
if we make meaningful, if we make changes to our living habits, will, will this actually make any meaningful contribution? Surely the real change will come from the government and the corporates and the onus needs to be on them to make genuine systemic changes and not just pay lip service. I think this is a sort of question that quite a lot of people have asked in different ways. I mean, we've had the 10 point plan today, as you said. Well, um, uh, if government makes companies and others do things and does regulation, that's all uh, um, often very good. Uh, the consequence will show up in your bills. And so that's, that's the fundamental thing that comes from it. I mean, I'll give you an example. So the, the comment about plastics and the choice that producers have to use virgin uh, petrochemical plastic or recycled, okay? So mm -hmm. if the oil price is $40, which it is now, and my view is that as we gradually come out of the oil industry, the oil price will keep falling. The relative cost of using new petrochemicals versus waste is a lot uh, more biased towards manufacturing more plastics than it was when oil was $100. Now, if oil had $40 plus a serious carbon tax, right, then we'd use a lot more recycled material. And that's an example of just how powerful these switches can be. And so one of the key regulationary uh, regulation changes in waste is the idea of producer responsibility. And this is the idea that, you know, if you produce stuff, you know, oil company, you produce um, carbon emissions from your oil and gas or packaging from supermarkets and, uh, and so on, that you must take it back. You must be responsible for it. That's the polluter pays principle, really. And that will make what you buy as a consequence more expensive than it otherwise would have been. So this is a completely artificial idea between that we can just deal with business and it's all business's fault. And if business does the right thing, we'll be fine. Well, business does that stuff for us. You buy the eggs, you buy the fashion. And when we change the incentives on business through regulation, so on, great idea, it will show up in your bills, which comes back to the point mm -hmm. business exists to produce stuff for us. And that's why I stress the consumption side of it. But I'm all in favor of the regulations. But the first regulation I want is to enforce the price of carbon. And I would put the take back rule as part of polluter pays as in that frame. Thank you. Um, we've got two, three um, questions coming in here about what exactly is a circular economy? I mean, I'd like to get both Steve and Lucy's view on this. Steve, I'll start with you. Is there, is there such a thing as a, something that produces no waste? Um, if you go to the British sugar factory that's about an hour from me, 30 years ago, it was very much similar to other sugar factories around the world. It made sugar. It took sugar beet in and everything that didn't come out of sugar would be put back into a truck and sent back to the farm. It's biological. It would degrade. It would go back onto the land. Now they have people with PhDs and masters and white coats looking at every waste stream, looking for interesting fibers and molecules. So they're extracting a molecule called betaine, which is a nutraceutical for fish farms, fish food. That's $6,000 a kilogram. Previously, we used to throw it back onto the field. Because of that, they've completely changed the system. A factory that has 120 trucks a day of sugar beet arriving now sends three trucks a year to landfill. So it is possible, but it is non-trivial to build a no waste system. It is non-trivial. It is a systemic change of the sort that Lucy is commenting on. You can do that in other sectors. It's easier in biology because eventually everything decomposes anyway, right? That's that's really interesting. I mean, Lucy, coming, coming to you, um, I mean, Ellen MacArthur has been doing the circular economy thing for quite some time. I mean, I was always very riveted by her, her ideas about carpets that she was working on in Holland. And how, how effective can it be, you're on mute by the way at the moment, how effective can it be in the fashion world or, or indeed in plastics? Because that was something I learned from your book that so many plastics have so many different polymers all blended together that in fact, it's almost impossible to pick them apart, to recycle them. I'm, I'm yet to be convinced that plastics are a circular material myself. A lot of energy and resources and time is going into proving that they are. Um, I think there's a couple of issues. I think I'm, 
my whole thing is the real circular economy. What we have that passes for circular economy a lot at the moment is a, a sort of semi-circular version where maybe something, a plastic item is recycled once, it's actually downgraded. Uh, you know, it's not that a bottle is going into a bottle, it's usually into something that's not of high enough value. And that for me is not circular because it needs to hold its value as it goes round the system. Um, and all it does is really kick the can down the road, if you'll excuse the, the mixing of materials. Um, so uh, for me, I think there's a, there's a lot of subterfuge going on. And I also think that what that's hap what's happening is it, it's, it's essentially greenwashing the status quo. It's, it is the linear economy. So we need something that is, um, as, as, as Steve said, it is a different system. It is a shift. I think within the EU Green Deal, is it called the Green Deal? I get yeah. confused. But the circular economy principles, a central pillar of that, are really very good. And by the analysis that I've seen, there's sort of 70% of what's needed to bring in a circular economy. And when it's a real circular economy, you unlock all of these advantages, one of which is decarbonizing because of the embodied energies in, in, these, in these goods. And another one is jobs. Uh, I think that European report speaks to 700,000 jobs, um, which you know, then that speaks to uh, Miata's uh, uh, green jobs and green reset that we need. The circular economy should be center of all of this thinking. Thank you, that's good. Um, Miata, um, one of, well, actually we've got more than one question um, on the subject of, okay, if we change the system, which we should, um, what happens back in say developing countries where dependency has grown on this incredibly unhealthy system. I mean, you know, Lucy mentioned the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh and, but yet, you know, these garment industries are part of the economies. How do we, how will the world re-resource, retrain to make fairness into a, a new system? Yeah, and that is a really, really good question. Um, and I think one of the big risks is that, you know, we talk about a Green New Deal here, they're talking about it in the US. You can imagine lots of countries individually making big changes, um, but not thinking about the impact globally. Um, and I think the answer is it has to be a global endeavor. Um, and we are going to have to make that change country by country. And there is some heavy lifting that will need to be done by countries that have broader shoulders in order to enable that mm -hmm. to happen. Um, but it isn't with, with it. It is not out with our collective um, capacity to do. And you know, the idea of the circular economy is a really powerful one. It creates jobs. It creates values. Um, and we can do that here, and we can do that globally. Uh, but it requires a determination to shift, um, which is why I come back to. In the end, it will have to be collective. It is a collective endeavor, but it will only happen. Our politics will only shift if we, as individuals, demand that it shifts. Thank you. Now we're coming to the end and I'm going to in a minute ask all of you for a very simple, uh, well maybe not so simple, but a kind of call to action that we can all do. But there's something I really want to ask Dieter and in fact someone called Giovanna Daviti has asked it too, but it's puzzled the hell out of me, which is why have our emissions gone up during this pandemic year when we haven't been traveling, we haven't been flying and we on the whole have been shopping a lot less. Why is it still going up? Because we would have to do a great deal more than what we, so to speak, haven't done this year. Can you can you answer that? Well, I was very careful to say that what matters is the carbon concentration in the atmosphere, which is carried on going up. And the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is net of emissions and the natural carbon sequestration of our planet. I mean, that's what's kept the, the, that value constant for the last millions of years. And what we've continued to do is destroy the ability of our planet to absorb carbon by burning down the rainforests. You know, you can list it out. And at the same time, we have had a temporary reduction of emissions. But by May this year, China's emissions were back to the level of May 2019. China's building 148 gigawatts of new coal, more coal than the entire installed capacity of Europe. That's what's really going on. And we delude ourselves if we think that, you know, if we close British steel in Britain and import a bit of steel from China, that somehow we in Britain are going to be making a big difference to global climate change. And so that's why I stress it's the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere 
two parts per million, right through the financial crisis as well. It just marches up. And we have to look at that natural environment, which we haven't discussed in this conversation, its ability to sequestrate that. And the agriculture, which produces many of the goods that we consume, has been releasing the soil, uh, the carbon from the soil. And just to the side, one final little factoid. The soil has four times the carbon of the atmosphere. And if you mm -hmm. strip that out, you can reduce your emissions a bit for a few months, but you won't make much difference to total global warming. Oh gosh, that's opened up so many things I want to talk to you about, about China, about this is terrible. You'll have, you'll have to come back for another session because it's now one minute over time and I'm going to have to stop. Thank you so much, but I said sort of, I'm sorry to leave everybody on such a lot of cliffhangers. Um, in one word though, Dita, there's the fact that the Chinese have committed to their reduction by 2060. Are you, um, are you saying that they are uh, kicking the can, the old proverbial can that's constantly being kicked down the road and leaving it to a future generation? You've got like one word answer here. Absolutely, yes. You know, the world cannot withstand the envelope of emissions from China from now to 260. That's 40 years of further emissions. You won't stop at two degrees at that. And you have to remember that Chinese stuff is not just for the Chinese. It's for all the rest of us who buy those products. We should pay for that coal-based pollution in the greatest polluter globally. And they are on a growth path, which means in 15 years, there'll be two Chinas, not one. It will double in size. That's what climate change is really about. Right, guys, we've got our work cut out. Um, on that incredibly non-cheery note, um, Steve, what would be your call to action for everybody? Um, I learned this because somebody came to me, uh, a CEO of a cement company, badgered me for a meeting. I'd never met them before. And when I asked them, why is all of a sudden this so high on your agenda? They said, I was driving to work one morning and my daughter from the back of the car said to me, mum, what are you doing about climate change? And I would encourage everyone in this room to ask their parents that question amazing pressure can be generated. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Miata, what would be your take out and call to action? There's a campaign called Build Back Better, uh, and we are fighting uh, for this to be a reset, and we're fighting for a green recovery to be at the heart of it. Uh, join it, make your voices heard, so that our politics can't deny this any longer. Thank you. Lucy? Um, I would love it if people could um, join an organisation um, and the organisation that I would really like you to join is Surfers Against Sewage, even if you're not a surfer and you've never been to Cornwall, because they are acting on all our behalf, particularly on plastic waste. Um, and they are um, uh, looking at structural change at the same time they mobilise communities to act. So they're really joining it together. Um, and I think that that's the best thing that you can do with your time and, and a little bit, a tiny bit of money. Thank you. That's a really good suggestion. That also sounds like a rather good Christmas present for people to give people. Yes. Dita. Um, I, I would like people to try and write down their carbon diary. And then when they finished it for the day, pick one thing to make their carbon uh, um, consumption a bit less. One small step starts a path and we can Thank do you. All right, just, I have to ask you then, how do I do a carbon diary? I mean, how do I count for the fact that I've been online for the last hour on a, an Apple Mac? That's precisely the point. It'll make you think about it and then you'll go and do some research and you'll go and find out. So next time you go on a plane and it's in your carbon diary, you'll do a bit of research and realize that that's a really bad thing to do compared with some of the other alternatives. It's not that there are definitive answers that you must know all these facts, otherwise you can't act is to get you inquisitive, to start thinking about it. Ask where that breakfast cereal came from. And asking questions is the way, dare I say it, and it might sound a little bit pretentious, it's the way to enlightenment. You know, educate yourself about it. Thank you. That's a great note to finish on. So thank you to all our audience out there. Um, you've been wonderful joining us for the last three sessions. We hope that we will be back next year. Really big thank you to Rathbones, who've been wonderful partners. And I think we could all say that we've had immense um, 
both enjoyment and a huge amount of learning. And as I said at the beginning, the Rathbones Planet Papers will be sent to you either later tonight or tomorrow. They will certainly be available, plus the podcast. And the details of all the speakers' books, Dita's and Lucy's, um, will be online. And all those books hugely recommended and they've certainly educated me and I suspect I could probably find out some of the answers to my carbon diary if I hunt around enough so thank you very much and um, please um, join us again and uh, it, I'm not quite sure where this leaves people in terms of what they buy for Christmas but without a doubt when you buy it think about it and try to figure out what its carbon footprint might be and whether it's a good thing or not. Probably not to buy too many Christmas baubles from a supermarket. Good night.